Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our class today on um, a special Tuesday class of Florida Friendly Landscaping. Today, I invite uh, one of my regular guests, Dr. William Lester, um, who's here to join me, talk about reducing your chemical use in Florida Friendly Landscaping. We're going to just talk about the ways that we can make a concentrated effort to have a beautiful landscape without relying on chemicals to make that happen. So, and yes, for those of you who are looking, I took this picture of this dragonfly here and we wanna protect our pollinators. Um, but I didn't realize I took such a great picture of poison ivy at the same time. So in case you're wondering, yes, that's what that was, but that was in the woods. So no chemicals necessary there. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities um, in the water department. Here is my email, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. If you would like a PDF copy of this program, because it's hard to remember everything that we're telling you, just go ahead and email me. I'll send you that PDF um, after the class. And as I said, I have Dr. William Lester of uh, Hernando County Extension with us and email him all of the hard questions at wlester at ufl.edu. All righty. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. You may say you're always talking about those. Well, yeah, that's my job yeah, <laughs> to bring you the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And we're going to be covering all of them in one way or another pretty much today. I don't know that we'll specifically cover number four mulch, but pretty much all the others we're going to really hit on today because they all assist us, mulch even assists us in using less chemicals. So let's talk about number one, right plant, right place. How does that help us um, not rely on chemicals in our yard? Very easily. The, the plants that are well suited to the site conditions are going to be healthier plants. They're not going to, they're going to have resistance to disease and insects. They're just, if they are where they're meant to be. Um, and we're going to cover native plants in this presentation as well. But even with native plants, you still have to uh, utilize right plant, right place because just because it's native, and I'm only recently learning that some people try to use the loophole native, meaning native to America. Well, <laughs> Florida's rather different than the rest of America. I don't know if you have noticed that. I'm talking horticulturally, of course. Um, uh, but, you know, when we talk about native plants, there are ecotypes. We need to find native plants native to central Florida, number one, because the same black eyed Susans that, you know, are growing in Michigan, we have a different type that grow here. You need, and that's just one example. Also your site conditions. Some native plants are for wet areas, some are for dry areas, some are for light, some are for shade, just like any other plant. So just saying, well, these are native, they're gonna do great. No, it still goes back to right plant right place. And you want to avoid those problem plants. One example we always give um, is an oleander. Beautiful plant, isn't it, Dr. Lester? Yes, I like them. I think they look nice. Yeah, you see them a lot on the East Coast. They must be very salt tolerant. And I see them around here, but they have a particular um, insect, caterpillar really, that is in love with them. And what is it called, Dr. Lester? The oleander caterpillar. <laughs> so kind of the rule is there, if you have a plant that has an insect named after that plant, <laughs> it's highly likely you're gonna have a problem with that insect on that plant. Now, do the oleander caterpillars totally destroy the oleanders, Dr. Lester? I've never seen it 
kill an oleander. They will eat most all the leaves off an oleander, but oleanders are pretty tough. They generally put more leaves back on. So they survive the caterpillar damage. And what do the caterpillars become? Um, they become technically a moth. It is a daytime flying moth that looks like a wasp. They're very colorful. Most people would confuse it for a wasp and run away from it, but it's really just a moth that flies during the day. Polka dotted wasp moth it even has wasp in its name, but that's just mm -hmm. because of its shape. It won't sting you. So if you want oleanders, I would suggest keeping them in the backyard. Don't use them as a specimen specimen plant because um, the caterpillars are going to be there munching on them. Or rather than killing yourself, spraying it because it's in your front yard and you want it to look beautiful and you have this big battle, give up that battle, let those caterpillars have it and just put it in an area that is, you know, where not a lot of people are going to see it. And forcing plants to grow in non-ideal conditions is just looking for problems. If, you know, we can, to an extent, depending on the shape and size of our living room, move furniture around the way that we desire it to be. We try to think of that in our landscape. Well, this will look good over here. It, you know, the plants don't care about our desires. <laughs> They just don't. They care about the conditions that they grow in, and they're not going to perform if they're not in those optimum conditions. So you really need to keep an eye out for those things. You can uh, find help in choosing the type of plants that you may want for your landscape uh, from Florida Friendly Landscaping. We have a book. I have the book right here. There's a hard copy of the book. And it is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. Yes, I've been doing this for seven years and still had to read that long <laughs> title. Um, you can get uh, one of these books for free in various ways. You can stop by Dr. Lester's office. Um, it is right next to the post office on Aviation Youth Drive, Spring Hill Drive post office there. Um, what, Monday through Friday, eight to five? Yes, ma'am. Teresa, she'll be glad to give you one. You can stop by the Master Gardener Nursery and talk to some great master gardeners, pick up some plants and get one of these free books. They're at 19490 Oliver Street in Brooksville and they're open Wednesdays and Saturdays, about 8.30 to 11. Yes, they're open till 11 right now. It's their summer hours. Right. When it's cooler, they'll be they'll stay up until noon, but nobody wants to be out there after <laughs> they no. it. And they're working pretty hard too. Or you can go to watermatters.org and go to um, resources for residents. That is the Southwest Florida Water Management District. They actually print these books for us. So I gotta give them a plug. <laughs> but if you go online that way, you can order one and they will mail it to your house for free. Or you can ask me, here's my email again. I have a bunch here. I'm not always here in the office, not always easy to catch, but if you email me, we can make an appointment if you happen to be going by or stopping by anyway. But of course, because this is 2021, there's an app for that. Not really even an app. You don't have to download anything. It's a web tool. So if you go um, to your Play Store on your phone, and ask for the look, put in Florida Friendly Plant Guide, you'll find it there in a way that you could have at the nursery and say, oh, I'm looking for yellow native plants that do well in the sun or, you know, something, and it'll really, it'll help bring it up for you. So those are both great tools. I have both. Now let's talk about watering efficiently is a way uh, to use less chemicals. Overwatering. Probably in our uh, community, I would say, Dr. Lester, wouldn't you, that there's a lot more problems with overwatering than underwatering. Yes, I rarely look at somebody's lawn problems and tell them that what they need to do is go home and water it. Yeah. Yes, so people, um, I think because we like to be in control, 
So we think, oh, you look sick, so you need more water. That's the first step we take. And generally overwatering causes more problems than even underwatering. Um, because why? Because nature's gonna water it. <laughs> you know, even if you don't think it will, nature's gonna water it. So there's more problems with overwatering. And you wanna check your system. Make sure it's operating efficiently. This system here, you see there's obviously a clog or a leak or some kind of problem where the water is not shooting out like it should. It's just bubbling up and watering the sidewalk, basically. Um, and leaks can uh, cost you money. Not, um, it is more um, economically efficient to have those leaks repaired than to get a bill from the water department that you, you know, will not make you happy because you have a leak in your irrigation system. So have those things checked out. Make sure it is watering the lawn, not your house, not the street, not a tree that grew in front of the uh, sprinkler head. You know, make sure that it is, um, you have what they call head-to-head -head coverage meaning here is an irrigation head, here's one, and this one reaches that one, and that one reaches that one, so you don't have bare spots. And see the issue, and it's hard with lawns um, to talk about right plant, right place, because we force things in, in this world. And you know we're building houses everywhere, and I'm watching it in my neighborhood these houses springing up all over the place in Northwestern uh, Fernando County. And what they do is they come in and they clear cut it. Within an hour, every tree that has been there for a hundred years is gone, maybe 50, 70 years, whatever, they're gone. And they kind of even it out and then they bring in what they call this fill dirt. Dr. Lester is fill dirt topsoil no, fill dirt tends to be uh, soil that they get from um, digging retention ponds, uh, digging large holes in the ground, and fill dirt is a real mixed bag. You really have no idea what you're getting, and as a general rule, it's not very good for growing any kind of plants in. They get it from so deep down, it really doesn't even have any nutrients whatsoever, and so they put that down, you know, and build your house. And then they throw a lawn on top of this nearly barren soil. So that is what we are dealing with. And sometimes in the building process, even though it is very sandy here, we do end up with compacted soil. So there are ways of dealing with that because we can't um, practice the ideal when we've had a lawn thrown on top of this builder as far as right plant, right place. Um, but we're going to talk about the different ways of adding um, compost, even in your plant beds, adding uh, mulch, which will break down and somewhat over time, you know, try to make this soil fairly decent soil for something to grow in. Also, you know, just some, some turf is very difficult to grow in some areas of Florida. I do need to remind you while we're talking about watering that Hernando County, this is our watering restrictions for always, not, you know, this isn't a temporary thing. It's one day a week. And the shocking thing to a lot of people is even if you own your own well, which I do, but I don't irrigate anyway. Um, why is that, Dr. Lester? Why do people who own their own well have to be on these same watering restrictions as people on a municipal system? Because it applies to everybody. So whether your water comes from your own private well or from Hernando County Utilities and basically their well, it's all coming from the same aquifer. That's right. We're all getting it from the same aquifer. We all need to protect. I call the aquifer our water savings bank. And we all need to um, keep some of that savings in there. Or we're going to be in trouble. Mowing high. We talk about this all the time. I think maybe we get a little annoying about it, but 
It's because it's so imperative to the health of your central Florida lawn, mowing three and a half to four inches each time. You mow lower than that, which probably happens the majority of the time. You are stressing that living organism, which is your lawn. You're stressing that plant. Um, it is meant to grow at three and a half to four inches. Both um, Floritam, uh, St. Augustine Floritam, and Vahea needs to be that high. Here I'm showing a picture of right plant, right place. That is why Florida Friendly Landscaping doesn't come out and say lawns are bad because it all reverts back to right plant, right place. This lawn is the right plant in the right place. Now, remember Dr. Lester, years ago, we did a home visit I'm in a neighborhood and they had a creek like going through their yard. Mm -hmm. This is down the street from there. Okay. So what, what can you tell me about that neighborhood? That's in, that's very close to downtown Brooksville. Uh, very hilly, uh, very heavy soil. There's a certain, there's a good amount of clay in the soil. So the soil stays to stay a little wetter. Yeah. Uh, very, very different than from Spring Hill, if you live in the Spring Hill area. Right. So this is St. Augustine, and this person, she told me closer to her house it had been fertilized, but that's not where I took this picture. I was, you know, <clears throat> eight feet away from her house looking into the backyard. No fertilizer, no watering. So let's go to right plant, right place. And, and she mows it pretty high, as you can see there. Looks. Beautiful, doesn't it? Got to remember also this is July. <laughs> so does it look this beautiful in April or May? Probably not. But, you know, so some areas are okay for lawns. Some it's more of a struggle, but it's going to be even more of a struggle if we don't mow it high. I mean, that's the beginning and the end of it all. If you mow it too low, you're opening your lawn up uh, to diseases, take all root rot. You're opening it up to potential of uh, insects because the insects, um, you know, they smell whatever they feel, the pheromones, which indicate a stressed lawn. So mow it high. You know, that's actually really good news because it's such an easy fix. All right, Dr. Lester, I'm going to let you cover um, if we fertilize appropriately, how that can reduce our chemical use. Okay, I think most of the takeaway message today is if you manage your plants, whether it's a lawn, whether it's a hedge, whether it's a tree, whatever you're trying to grow, if you manage it properly, you have the best chances of it growing well, doing well, and not having to use large amounts of insecticides or herbicides or fungicides or anything else on it. Fertilizing appropriately is very important because you need to know what plant you're trying to grow and fertilize it properly. A lot of people think that if a plant has a problem, if their lawn doesn't look quite right or your bush or rose bush doesn't look quite right, the solution is to fertilize it. And that's definitely not always the case. When it comes to lawns, I've looked at a lot of lawn samples and pictures and people bring in one square foot chunks of their yard for us to look at under the microscope. And I don't think I have ever told anybody to go home and water their lawn or fertilize it because that's never ever the solution for whatever their problem is. And you can have a lot of different problems with the lawn, but generally fertilizer is not gonna be the cure. So it's very important that when you do fertilize your lawn, you follow the label and put down the appropriate amount of fertilizer. You don't want to put down too much all at once. It's very bad for your lawn. We recommend that people stay away from weed and feed products, especially this time of year. When we start getting into July and August in the hot time of summer, if you put down any kind of herbicide or weed killer in your lawn to kill the weeds, you're running a very real possibility of killing your entire lawn. If you read that label, it's gonna say, do not apply this pro product when the temperature is above 85, 90, whatever it may be for that product. 
because if you do put it down and it's very hot, it may kill your long grass too. Uh, be very careful because I know that not everybody watching us today is necessarily in Hernando County. Different counties in Florida have fertilizer ordinances. Not every county, but most counties at this part at this point do have some kind of ordinance. So you want to be aware of that and when you're allowed to fertilize, what kind of fertilizers you're allowed to use and not allowed to use, depending on exactly where you live. But I know that a part of our fertilizer ordinances, you're not allowed to fertilize right before a huge heavy downpour or when there's a tropical storm or hurricane coming, because that's just going to result in a lot of runoff fertilizer that's going to go into a waterway. Don't calendar fertilize, and that's when you fertilize because it's April 1st or June 1st or what a certain date. You only want to fertilize any plant when it absolutely needs it. You should always have a reason to fertilize. If you're saying, oh, I'm going to fertilize just because it's a good thing to do or a pretty day out, that's not a very good reason to fertilize. Don't use lime, and I know a lot of people move here from uh, northern states where they just normally put down an application of lime certain time every year, <clears throat> lime will raise the pH of your soil. So if the pH of your soil is already high and you put down lime, you're just going to make the pH even higher. And you may start to have a lot of problems with different various plants, depending on what you're growing. They may not be that tolerant of really high pH. And then, like I said, follow your local, uh, be aware of your local ordinances and be sure to follow them because you wouldn't want to be out there fertilizing your lawn at the wrong time of year and have a problem with code enforcement or anybody else. So you want to be aware of those ordinances. Okay, next slide. And then consider compost. Researchers, research has found in the last couple of years, one of the best things that you can add to a lawn that's gonna help reduce diseases, make it less attractive to chinch bugs and other insect pests and make it grow better and help to reduce your yearly need for fertilizers is compost. You can do this if you're having to resod your yard, you can hire a service to come and bring truckloads of compost and work it in the soil first before you put the sod down. But if you have an existing lawn, you can go out there and top dress the lawn and that could be as simple as just going to the store and buying a couple of bags of black cow cow manure and just take it and just fling it out there. Just throw it out lightly and evenly. The next time it rains or you water, it's going to work its way into the soil. And your grass, especially St. Augustine grass, is going to absolutely love that. And then something else that we always recommend is that when you're cutting the grass, don't bag the clippings. Go ahead and use a mulching mower and grind the clippings up and let them fall back down. Here in Florida, that does not cause any problems with your turf grass. A lot of times people will think that, well, those clippings are just gonna pile up and now I'm gonna to have to do something with them. I'm gonna to have to rake the lawn. No, this is Florida and things, little tiny grass clippings are gonna decay and return to the soil very, very quickly here. It probably happens slower up north but here in Florida, it happens very quickly. So mulching the grass clippings when you're cutting the lawn is just fine here. You don't ever want to cut a lot off of your grass. So don't ignore your lawn for, let's say, three weeks and go out there and now it's knee high and you set your lawnmower at the lowest setting and you're grinding through the lawn. Really long grass clippings are going to break down slowly. But if you cut your lawn as needed on a regular basis and all you have is just little grass clippings, they're going to break down just fine. Next slide. Okay. Can you hear me, Boo? Yes, I can still hear you. All right. Well, I while you were talking, I touched my cord and lost uh -oh. the for a while and it freaked out. So I was making sure I was still around. You're still know. on. Okay. Also, um, we were talking about right plant, right place, and lawns. Now let's say you have an area that just refuses to grow the lawn. You know, you've been fighting with it for years, you've been putting new sod down and it just won't grow. We say, if at all possible, you know, within the restrictions that you live in, um, if you can 
if lawns won't grow there, then just try something else. You know, <laughs> try a different type of um, ground cover, or even if it's just because you don't want to deal with a lawn anymore, you know, and so you just start to limit your lawn, the amount of space that your lawn takes up and ground covers are uh, one way to do that. This is a picture of the Orange County um, Extension Office. And you can see this is a bed obviously here, but instead of, you know, throwing down just turf there, they're using this um, Asiatic Jasmine. This stuff is tough. In fact, the only time I ever saw Asiatic Jasmine have an issue for the first time ever was last May. Remember, we had no rain whatsoever for quite a while here. And um, first time ever I saw spots, patches in um, some jasmine start to brown out. It's all fixed now, you know, the rain came and it, you know, it straightened itself out, but it doesn't react to cold or freezes. And it retains a very nice formal looking shape there too. There are other um, options you can use. Um, you know, turf is not always the answer. And we have different classes on ground covers and um, the University of Florida has publications you can look up on different ground covers to use for your site conditions. But don't think you just have to have lawns because everybody does. The more plant beds you have over time, the, once you get those established, they're gonna survive on natural rainfall and you're gonna be using a whole lot less water. And we discussed going native. So yes, go native. I, I'm trying to start a kind of mini campaign so that people don't become overwhelmed because if you're like me, you think you become, you give yourself too big of a project. So I'm gonna go native. That means I need to make every plant in my yard native. And that can be a little bit overwhelming. If you want to do that, kudos, great. You know, but if everyone in this state bought three native plants this year, think about what a big difference that would make. Because native plants, they're adapted to the areas they're meant to be in um, and those particular site conditions. Um, you know, if it's a swamp type native and you have a more wet area, then they're going to do fine there. Um, if they're, I live in a very dry area, got a lot of dry natives coming up. So native plants, um, and another thing we're learning about native plants and we're trying, you know, we're always adjusting to new things. So cycles, on earth and in the world and different climate um, changes that have occurred. Native plants have always been there <laughs> to adapt to these changes. So that's another thing to think about. You know, it's not a forced plant we brought from somewhere else. It's a plant that's always been in this region. Therefore, it has been through many things. So you might have some more success keeping them, you know, as we go along. Um, also, there is no better way to attract pollinators or wildlife than to plant native. You may not even think I'm trying to attract butterflies and uh, bees and pollinators and all these wonderful things, but I just want to plant natives. And then guess what? In doing so, you're going to attract to that wildlife. So it's a great, and you know, native plants in the proper site conditions shouldn't need any kind of chemicals at all. Also diversity, diversify your assets, diversify your landscape assets. Diversity is the key to any healthy ecosystem, no matter if we're talking on a molecular level or you know on up for everything. And our landscape is no different. And I don't just mean, although this is a good thing too, um, to have different species of plants. If you wanted to have a Florida friendly certified yard, you need at least 15 different species of plants on up to 25 or more. Um, just because what happens with a monoculture, Dr. Lester, a monoculture of plants? 
if there is any kind of insect pest or disease that causes problems with that plant and you have a monoculture or a very, very large area of that plant growing, when the disease or insect pest comes, it's going to become a very, very large problem. Right. And, you know, we're kind of getting pretty close to that in, in all of America with, with turf, even though it's different types of turf, you know. Um, that's why sure. if you live in a subdivision and you and all your neighbors have big front lawns and it's all the same type of grass, you're going to share all the same problems. Um, turf grass can have a lot of problems and it can be very, very expensive to keep replacing it with the same type of turf grass over and over again. And I, I was just discussing with you, I was just, I just spent a week in coastal Virginia in the Hampton Roads area. And I love crepe myrtles. <laughs> Believe me, I do. I have one and I wouldn't mind having more. But while I was up there, you can't turn a circle <laughs> without seeing crepe, motor, um, crepe myrtles. And they're gorgeous. And I will give them kudos is that oh, probably 99% of them do not over prune them. You can see that they let them grow to their full glory and they look gorgeous and colorful and beautiful. But I do think it's a little overdone. They're starting to create a monoculture of a non native plant that, sure, you'll see bees or birds or whatever go to the flowers, but like compared to an oak tree, which is going to have over a hundred different species it hosts, you know, great mortals don't really do that. Um, so you just gotta be careful to keep things in balance. And not only that, you want uh, not just different species, different sizes and shapes of plants. That's gonna help with your wildlife value as well. Not only that, it looks good, doesn't it? This again is, I took this at Orange, Orange County Extension Office. So you have different um, shapes and sizes. You have these native dwarf yopon hollies which they're naturally that nice meatball shape that we like to see in a shrub. Then they have some of their annuals. So it looks like nasturtium there. And then, you know, bigger bushes and then like a tall, which might actually be a great myrtle there, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, um, you know, upright. And that welcomes more hiding places where wildlife feels um, more comfortable um, for nesting places or just hiding places or food to eat. Um, so it, it looks good to your eye and it also serves a lot of functions when you diversify those assets. And also when you have different types of plants, if one plant dies out, your yard still looks good because well, you just take that out and you have lots of other types of plants around. Now I created the three T's here of proper pruning, <laughs> technique, timing, and tool care. So I created those three T's, but I'll let Dr. Lester um, elaborate on them. Sure, proper pruning is important for any plant, whether it's a palm tree or an oak tree or um, a hedge bush. And you always want to prune for plant health, not necessarily for what your neighbor does or your brother-in-law says you should do or what you maybe you think looks pretty, but is really bad for the plant's health. Good example is I see uh, quite a few, I've seen oak trees, I've seen elm trees, and just recently a row of holly trees, small holly trees that for a number of years had all been pruned in the shape of a great big ball. And that's absolutely terrible for those trees. It ruins them, shortens their lives. And now the hollies are going to have to be replaced because as they keep pruning them in a ball, they're starting to get very large dead spots on them. That's because the outer edge of it becomes too dense. The inside of the tree gets too dense. It's dark. It's wet. Start to have diseases. And pretty much it's shot and has to be replaced. So it's going to really greatly reduce the lifespan of your trees if you prune them in an incorrect shape or basically not for the tree's health. Uh, timing is very important. 
um, and University of Florida, whatever plant or tree or bush you're thinking about pruning has a lot of really good information about how it should be pruned, when to prune it. Pro another very, very important T that Lily put on here, tool care. And this is very important for anybody who may hire a service to prune your palm trees or oak trees or something else is to make sure that they're actually professionals and know what they're doing and that they clean and sanitize their equipment. Because we do have certain diseases, mostly of palm trees, where if that service goes in the morning and prunes a palm tree and it has a disease, the disease, the fungus or the virus is gonna be on the equipment. And now they come out to your house at noon and they start pruning your palm tree it may look great, but now it's just caught the disease from the other tree earlier that day. So very important that they clean their equipment and you clean your equipment also. That could be as simple as just filling up a little spray bottle with rubbing alcohol. The grocery store stuff, 70% isopropyl, spray it on your pruning saw, saws and clippers and it'll disinfect it. It'll dry up in just a couple seconds. So it's not gonna hurt anything. But sanitation is very important for keeping healthy plants, especially with your, all of your pruning equipment, all of your trimming equipment. Next slide. Well, while we're talking about that, um, let's just talk a little quickly on tree pruning. Um, there are people uh, who still believe you should cut flush to the trunk. And um, what do you say about that? I don't really see that a whole lot. Um, you do see that on some homeowners when they go out and just start hacking away at their trees. Anything can happen then. Um, but you don't want to cut the branches flush up against the trunk. You want to cut out a little bit by the collar. Like I said, University of Florida, if you look online, they have little diagrams about how to properly cut a branch off of a tree. And for anybody who might be wondering, do we still use that black tar? <clears throat> to paint the cut part no you don't want to use that in florida i don't know if they still use that anywhere or up north if it's still appropriate i believe it's um they're not doing it anywhere i don't think yeah because that holds moisture in and now the cut stump if you cover it with tar is going to rot so you don't want to if you prune a branch off just leave it be let it air dry it's going to dry over and callus over and the tree, if you cut it correctly, will most of the way cover it back over to keep insects and diseases out. It'll be fine. Okay. Right. So no black tar. And um, if we have uh, potential problems in our yard, what do I mean by scouting it out? Scouting is what professional growers do or pay people to do, which is basically go out there and check the plants and see what's going on. So they'll go out there and I know uh, if you are a farmer or if you work for a farmer and you're scouting a field, you may check like every fifth plant. So you check the tomato plant, count down, check the fifth tomato plant, go every five plants, and you're going to look over the entire plant, top of the leaves, turn the leaves over, use your hand lens to see what kind of insects are on there. Are there any black spots? Are there any missing leaves, chewed up leaves? What is causing those problems? As I turn the leaves over, am I finding a couple of spider mites, a couple of aphids, other things I need to keep a lookout for? If I do see aphids, do I see any ladybugs eating the aphids? These, this is all information you need to know to make a um, proper decision on whether you're gonna chemically treat or not. Because let's say you turn over a leaf on your hibiscus and you see aphids, but you see ladybugs eating the aphids. You may go like, yay, I have ladybugs eating the aphids. I don't have to spray. The ladybugs are keeping them under control for me. If you turn over that leaf and you see a whole ton of aphids and no ladybugs, maybe you need to make that decision to spray with insecticidal soap to knock the number of aphids back. So scouting, you don't know what's happening with your plants unless you go out there and look. And people who have the worst problems are the ones who ignore things. And all of a sudden, and I've got a phone call, 
my tree in front of my house died. It looked fine yesterday and it died overnight. No, it didn't die overnight. What happened was you put in a new sidewalk, a new pipe, a new septic system three years ago or planted the tree three years ago, planted it too deep and it's been dying oh so slowly for three years and last night decided to kind of throw in the towel and give up. So a lot of things don't die quickly for no reason. If you scout, you're gonna catch problems when they're very early on and very easy to solve because it's the basis of a whole bunch of old sayings. Um, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Catching problems early. If you, can, if you have a plant and you have a couple spider mites on it, easy to take care of. If you ignore it and wait until your plant is completely covered with webbing, replace the plant. You can't fix it at that point. So catching things early and you could snip them out, just a little squirt of insecticidal soap, uh, pick that leaf off and throw it away if it has leaf miners. Very easy to solve if you catch it early. If you don't catch it early, things are gonna be a lot worse for you. That's my favorite thing to do is the cutting it out. You know, take walks in the morning, in the late afternoon, whatever in your yard. You see a problem that's only on one branch, one leaf, cut it out, <laughs> you know, throw that away in your kitchen trash. Don't just throw it on the ground because then the problem is still there. Um, well, if you're growing tomatoes and you find one caterpillar that's eating up your tomato plant, just pick them off and throw them over the fence. That's your problem solved. Everything. I really feel sorry for your neighbors. That's your problems. Um, just throw it over the fence. Or have a bucket of soapy water. That might help too to throw them in. No, it's easier to throw them over the fence. <laughs> I'm more into neighborly relations than you are. Well, my neighbors don't grow tomatoes, so it's not a big problem. Okay. Um, and while we're talking about scouting, you know, every bug you see, just because there is an insect there, doesn't mean it's a bad bug that's there to destroy your plant. That's the other thing you need to um, find out. If you don't know, then get a picture of it, send it to Dr. Lester, email it to him. That's his favorite way of IDing things. Yes, it is. <laughs> and ask, you know, is this a problem? Because if you get rid of it, you might be getting rid of one of your allies who will help you reduce your chemical use because um, just let the balance of nature, you know, do its thing. And um, I heard this recently, I didn't make this up, but I love it. If your plants don't have holes in them, then they're not part of the ecosystem. So we're not looking for protection, perfection out there. We are looking for protection of our ecosystem. And so, you know, this is my uh, passion vine. Never really gets to grow because these golf fritillaries are all over it all the time. Um, even this non-native hibiscus here, you know, nice bumblebee inside of it. If you sprayed it with chemicals, you're going to be harming, you know, the bumblebees as well. And this, I just had to look it up because I couldn't remember. It's a native plant that pops up in my yard. And I knew it had something to do with a dog. <laughs> so I went through a native plant site and finally found it's a dog tongue wild buckwheat. And I don't know if you know, Dr. Lester, what this pretty guy on it is. It's a Delta beetle. Delta beetle. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I knew that one. Okay. And I assume he's a good guy. Not particularly a good guy. It's not destructive. Chemical control is not recommended or needed. No. Yeah. No, he's just, you know, having dinner. <laughs> you know, why, why bother him? So you need to take a live and let live attitude. Also, the more insects, the more caterpillars you have, the more you're going to feed the birds as well. You know, it's a continuing cycle. And um, the more wasps you have, the more help you have with those aphids and the pest control. And you mentioned the ladybugs as well. And I just had a discussion yesterday with someone who is considering mail ordering uh, ladybugs for the aphids on her ginger. And I told her, no, don't do that. And what do you have to say about that? Ordering beneficial insects to release outdoors doesn't work really well. 
because the beneficial insects that you purchase or order and release tend to fly away. Right. Um, those kind of controls and that following that program works well in a greenhouse environment. Uh, there's a whole science and a lot of work that's done with, you know, raising appropriate beneficial insects to control specific pests in a greenhouse. Doesn't work really well outside. And if you just keep your fingers crossed, there's plenty of ladybugs in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They just have to find your plants and come and take care of your problem. And when you're ordering them, you might be, again, like I said, you know, ordering <laughs> ladybugs from Illinois. <laughs> you know, that's not our Florida ladybugs. So we want to control everything, but sometimes we need to step back and let nature do its thing. It, it, been doing it long before we came around. So we, we need to have that trust. Now, if it ever comes time, now Dr. Lester and I, we don't fertilize our yards. We don't uh, irrigate nope. our yards. We hardly use any nope. pesticides whatsoever. Maybe some um, fire ant bait is what I might use. But if there comes a time where a you know it might be time to do something and to step in integrated pest management is a system that is used all over the country the university of florida recommends it we um, also call it intelligent pest management and i will let dr lester explain integrated pest management or ipm well ipm is really a way of looking at dealing with whatever pests you have to deal with. That could be an insect, that could be a disease, that could be a weed, that could be nematodes. There's a lot of things out there that kind of fall under the heading of pests. And a lot of people, what they're looking for is pest control. So I have a pest, what do I go to the store and buy a spray that's gonna make my problem go away? And things are really never that simple. And a lot of times people will contact us looking for that silver bullet um, control or solution to the problem, and it just does not exist. Things work best if you take a multifaceted approach to it and take a whole bunch of little steps that help to you to produce healthy plants, appropriate plants for wherever you live, things are gonna do well where you live, putting them in the right spot in your yard, and preventing problems so that you rarely, if ever, get to the point where you're having to use chemical control. So this is a um, IPM um, pyramid here. And what you wanna do is start at the bottom and spend the majority of your time worrying about prevention. How do I prevent problems? I'm gonna pick plants that are gonna do well in my neighborhood, well, in whatever part of Florida that I live in. I'm gonna pick varieties that do well here. If it grows well in the sun, I'm going to put it in the sun. If it likes the shade, I'm going to plant it in the shade. I'm going to grow a healthy plant and try to prevent as many problems as I can. Cultural controls are everything from using mulch to help block weeds, watering correctly, not too much, not too little, fertilizing just right, planting things at the right time of year, if it's an annual or vegetables. Physical or mechanical control is, like I said earlier, if you have that one caterpillar, pick him off physically and throw him over the fence. That falls under physical or mechanical control. Biological control is if you see uh, ladybugs eating your aphids, you're not gonna spray, you're gonna let your beneficial insects take care of the problems, but you're gonna keep checking to see, hmm, I wonder who's gonna win this battle. Are the ladybugs gonna win? Or are they gonna fly away and the aphids get really bad? You need to keep checking but you probably don't need to go and spray anything that day. If you do things correctly, uh, you rarely, if ever, have to use a true chemical control. I don't think I own any. Uh, well, m the ones I own would be considered uh, low impact chemical controls. I do not own, and I can't remember the last time I would have ever bought something like seven or really um, hardcore, chemical controls for anything. I got palmetto bugs, the Australian roaches, a couple of them in our garage last year. I got bait 
and put it out. And in two days, it solved the problem. Mm -hmm. So for any of you who pay a service to come out every 30 days to spray for bugs, they're doing something wrong. You shouldn't have to spray every 30 days. You should be able to solve your problem. So those are, and Lily, I know you probably don't use, don't get to the point where you have to resort to chemical controls in your yard, except in very rare circumstances. And like I said, fire ants, and I put out a bait for fire ants, um, try to control those. And that, those, I only really have a problem in the dry times of the year. And then, you know, what usually happens is I say my neighbor and I play fire ant chess. <laughs> I just chase them back and forth into each other. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, that's it. I don't use any anything else, you know. Usually, I just, I don't have patience enough. If the plant is doing badly, I pull it out <laughs> and get rid of it. You know? It's too much work. I, I don't have yeah. time to go in there and start mixing stuff up in the pump sprayer and go out and spray it. Then you're going to have to follow up. I'll spray some insecticidal soap on the vegetable plants if I get, I had a problem with um, leaf footed bugs, but they're a really bad problem now because they were, they're causing problems with my remaining pepper plants. The peppers need to come out, it's pepper season is over. Sure. So, yeah. so the reason why I have a problem is from bad cultural control and bad timing and keeping them going. And so like follow, follow IPM, there are no silver bullet solutions out there and i like to cut even the chemical chemical control in half and down here start with the safer soap like you said horticultural soap and oil uh neem even you know the more you do have to treat those as pesticides and follow the label um but before i um, no, and i never get into that the heavy duty <laughs> chemicals at all no, and I, I never recommend it to people except for very, very specific situations. Sometimes you have to, but not mm -hmm. very often. And all of this, all that we've been talking about and the whole Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is uh, was developed to protect our waterways here in Florida. Florida um, has a lot of open waterways and we have a lot of springs underground. There's even though um, you may say, I don't live on the water. We all live on the water. We all live on top of the aquifer with a very porous soil that finds its way down into the aquifer. But even that, I, any of us, I would challenge any Floridian to take a 10 minute walk, you're gonna find some body of water, even if it's small, you know, somewhere. So it is something we need to protect one of our assets and reducing or eliminating the use of chemicals is one very good way of protecting our beautiful waterfront and our beautiful waterways. And um, I got a phone call yesterday from this gentleman, uh, Carmen Bruno. He uh, saw the press release about today's class. He wanted to participate, but he wasn't available today. But he wanted to let us know if you get to the point where you decide I'm not using any chemicals, what do you do with the chemicals that you have? See, this is how his brain thinks because he works, <laughs> he works at the landfill. So he um, wants you to be aware what to do with some of, whether they're outdated or you just don't wanna use them anymore, chemicals in your shed there. Um, so go ahead and give the solid waste um, department a call at 352-754-4112 and say, hey, I have this, I have some seven, I have whatever I want to get rid of. How do I do it properly? And because he couldn't join us to talk about that today, um, I do have other programs I've implemented called Florida Friendly Landscaping Community Connections. So he opened that door right up. He's going to be uh, my next guest on Community Connections, and that'll be available on Facebook after August 9th, where he will get into details of what to do with old chemicals as well as anything else, you know, Florida friendly and how um, all the all our different departments work together. And that's some compost that he's standing at <laughs> right there that, um, and we talked about you can top dress lawns with compost. Eventually, maybe in a few years, that's gonna be a program, an operating program at Hernando County Landfill as well. 
so um, I believe we have the chat <laughs> this time. Yes, we have a couple questions on there. Okay, so Dr. Lester is going to answer all your extremely hard questions. So well, these aren't too difficult. Okay, I can't see it, so I'll let you. Uh, oh, okay. You know. Nancy asked, if you have different varieties of crepe myrtles, is that still considered a monoculture? Yes and no. It depends on how different the varieties are. If the only difference is just the color of the flowers, then yeah, it probably would be considered a monoculture. The plants are essentially the same, just the flowers they produce are a different color. If they're um, genetically very different, it's not so much of a monoculture, yeah. although still kind of a monoculture. Yeah, what I was getting at is if um, the city of Hampton, the city of Virginia Beach, the city of Newport News, all those places that I was, um, if those great myrtles get a disease, it's going to wipe out like half of their tree population because they have, you know, so much of that. Not in their wooded trees or anything, you know, in the more woodsy areas, but the um, ornamental type trees. So that's what you need to be careful of. They're gorgeous, but there's just, I think, being a little bit overused. And that's something we all need to be careful of. So. Yeah, the problem is when all the individuals of that, that group are all susceptible to the same disease or insect pest. Right. So, I mean, if you have five or six in your yard, that's not <laughs> a big deal. Sure, that's fine. It's not like you have a hundred acres of wall-to-wall -wall crepe myrtles. Well, probably not. Uh, maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing against crepe myrtles. It's merely the use of the same plant that is um, non-diversified. Yeah, and I see a few scattered around Spring Hill that most of the year you really don't even notice because they've been just left to grow into a good sized tree. Yeah. But this time of year now they're flowering, they're just covered with white flowers and mm -hmm. they look beautiful. Yeah. And then people would say like, oh my gosh, what kind of tree is that? It's a crepe myrtle. Right. I thought crepe myrtles were all just big stubby stumps. <laughs> they get a couple flowers. Yes, yes. Yes. And Nancy also asks, is there any reason Sumter County doesn't follow the fertilizer ordinance? That is simple because each county creates their own fertilizer ordinance if they have one. A lot of counties fall under areas that are covered by a state of Florida basin management action plan. And that's because they have uh, springs within them that they're being protected. So Hernando County has springs, we have Wikiwachi. Pasco County feeds into Wikiwachi and they have their own springs. Citrus County, Marion County, and then up around along the west coast of Florida. Many other counties, Volusia County, there's a lot of counties that fall under these um, basin management programs. And the state of Florida said that if you're under one of those programs, you have to have some kind of fertilized ordinance. So that's why Hernando has one. Pasco must have theirs. Citrus does have theirs, I know. And they're, they all tend to be a little different. That's why we always say check with your county to find out what your specific ordinance is because yours may be very different from ours. But Sumter County is not under a base management action plan. And I guess is just not under a fertilizer ordinance. Okay. So, so they're just fertilizing freely over there, <laughs> over in the, the villages. They're just bringing it in by the dump truck load and putting and it all over the place and open for the best. Isn't, um, good for the health of your plants, either mm -hmm. for your lawn, either. <sighs> it, 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 it kills me when people just have this attitude with fertilizer, more is better. And more will fix every problem. And if your grass doesn't look right, fertilizer is the cure. And it's, I can honestly say it's 99.9% .9 of the time that is not correct. It is not the cure. Okay, do we have any other questions there? No, ma'am, I don't see any other questions on here. If anybody does have one, if you go down to the chat room 
little chat box at the very bottom and type it in. We can get to it real quick. In the meantime, we, we're going to have classes upcoming all the time. We're always pumping them out. Um, there is still room in our uh, virtual compost and rain barrel workshop. Um, just email me and I will send you um, all the details about that. It's for Hernando County residents. If you're not one, um, and but just want to listen in, you're certainly welcome to do so. Um, uh, next Wednesday, I have hiring Florida friendly. So that's going to be, there's a program that UF has started that it's new and it is for professionals to become certified as a Florida friendly landscaping professional. And Dr. Lester and I are in the midst of becoming trainers for that program. But in the meantime, I'm going to go over basically a publication that you have put out, but we're going to put it in more, you know, chattable form about if you're not the one who specifically takes care of your yard, but you want to get somebody in there who knows what they're doing as far as Florida friendly goes, how we can go about doing that. August 4th, I'm bringing back pretty plants that beat the heat. I was going to do that, but Elsa came and Dr. Lester and I shifted our focus to uh, being ready for the storm. On August 11th, tiny gardens with a big impact. You have just a small space. Even if you only have containers, you can still be Florida friendly. And on August 25th, I'm bringing trees, marvelous trees. Um, as promised during our um, tremendous storm prep class, this, this one will just cover trees in general and how to care for them. Um, you can go to our, my Facebook page or Dr. Lester's Facebook page to find the links for those as well. And again, here are our, our emails. So email me if you have any questions, if you'd like a PDF of this, if you'd like to know about the rain barrel, and compost bin workshop tomorrow evening. And there's Dr. Lester's email. If you have a really, really hard question, go ahead and uh, email him. And okay, we have a couple other questions and comments in here now. Okay. Nancy said about the fertilizer ordinance in Sumter County, she said, thank you. Yes, they do over fertilize in the villages. I lived in Sarasota and we had one. Yes, as a general rule, most coastal counties, yeah. Most coastal counties, and I don't know if that applies yet to all the counties um, up in the Panhandle that are on the Gulf Coast, but most all coastal counties do have some kind of fertilizer ordinance because they're coastal, because they border the Gulf of Mexico, and a lot of them have a lot of springs also. Mm -hmm. And SHKKB asks. What is the best way to find native plants to purchase? So, Lily, if you want to mention that Master Gardener Nursery again. Well, I'll let you do that, but I... Okay. Um, oh, no, that was something else I was working on <laughs> today. <laughs> um, um, if you look up F-A-N-N, -N, it's the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, .org, I believe, that um, will give you a list of native plants in your, native plant nurseries, I'm sorry, in your area. Also, I'll let Dr. Lester um, promote the Master Gardener, Fernando County Master Gardener Nursery. Sure. Uh, Nancy asked if we could put your email in the chat, so I'm typing in your lengthy email here. Okay. But our Master Gardener Nursery, they sell a lot of different, all the plants they sell are either Florida friendly or native. And they do have a great selection of different native plants. So if you go to the Master Gardener Nursery, either Wednesday or Saturday morning, you can look at what they have. And if you ever wanna stop by our office here, all of our flower beds out front are now in native plants, 100%. So we're using that as an example for people who maybe come by and oh, that's really beautiful. What is the name of that? Where can I get it? We have little signs in front of them with the names of the plants and we can help you figure out where to look to purchase some for yourself. Okay, so looking up the FANN.org, it will help you like find them in Sumter County, 
around the villages. I know there's a big one in Groveland for anyone who wants to make a day trip of it called Green Isle um, Nursery. Um, you can find. Um, the thing with native plants is you do have to make a concentrated effort to find them. You're not gonna wander into a big box store and come across native plants, unless it's muley grass or possibly some neopon holly. You do have to make a concentrated effort to make that happen. Yes, your options are very limited at the big box stores. Although there are a lot of Florida native plants that exist, we have quite a few here at our office. We were just out front this morning shooting a um, little short video with our master gardener, Alice Smith, who's in charge of that project. And we we're looking at some of the different native ground covers and they grow like weeds. They look great, they grow great. You don't have to fertilize them and you don't have to spend a lot of time and energy. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. And we will wrap this up for today. Thank you for joining us. Um, this will be available in a few hours on uh, Facebook. Um, so you can watch it again or send your friend to watch it. And eventually it will be on Hernando County government YouTube. Um, I don't know how long that's gonna take because they're having some staffing issues at the moment, but eventually it'll be there as well and closed captioned on there. So you wanna go and check Hernando County government YouTube. I keep saying government, but Hernando County government YouTube in there. Um, Dr. Lester has a few classes and I have dozens of classes on there. So you can, you know, catch up on what we've been teaching all year long. A lot of great information on there. Yep. Thank you, everybody. And have a great day. Okay, great. Thank you.